I'm going to start the symposium. So I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the fifth symposium for the Women's Brain Health Conference. Um, this, uh, conf this symposium is on reproductive cycle effects on brain and cardiac health. So I'm Cindy Barha. I'm a postdoc at uh, the University of British Columbia in the Faculty of Medicine. And I'm going to invite everyone to tweet what they learned today during the symposium using the hashtag WBHC2021. So that's Women's Brain Health Conference 2021. And please don't forget to tag um, our cluster. So that's at research on WH. So I'm gonna start first with a, our land acknowledgements. So we recognize that we live, work, play, and participate in community on the unceded, ceded, and traditional territories of the two, 203 First Nations, along with 38 Métis chartered communities each of which possesses their own unique traditions and history here on this land that we now refer to as British Columbia. We acknowledge the importance of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's call to action, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and the BC Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. In all of our work, we are committed to ensuring Indigenous women's rights to health and safety and the equal opportunity to participate in a manner that recognizes and respects Indigenous cultures and traditions. So today I'm joining you from Vancouver, which is part of the unceded homelands of the Coast Salish peoples and the traditional territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil First Nations. So for um, maybe our first time joiners, I'm going to do a little bit of what the cluster is. So this is the Women's Health Research Cluster. It's an organization that fights to improve women's health by promoting and expanding as well as catalyzing multidisciplinary women's health research. We do that by holding public events like this one, uh, incubating new research projects, giving out student awards, and collaborating with partners to advocate for systemic change. We have over 270 scientists, I think it's probably more than that now, uh, student and community members that live and work in 12 countries around the world. None of this would be possible, of course, without the support of people and organizations who believe that investing in women's health is a critical step towards making happier and healthier societies. So we'd like to thank Dr. Lisa Galea and Dr. Elizabeth Rideout for making significant donations to the cluster and to UBC, CHR, the Michael Smith Foundation, Women's Brain Health Initiative, Elsevier, and BioTalent Canada for supporting this conference. Um, I'd also like to uh, allow people, if they want to, use the chat feature to let us know where they're joining from, and you can use the chat feature to um, post any questions for the speakers. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing, and I will let our first speaker share her screen. So our first speaker, I have the um, privilege of introducing Dr. Emily Jacobs. Dr. Jacobs received her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and her BA from Smith College. So prior to moving to UCSB in 2016, she was an instructor at Harvard Medical School. She is the recipient of a 2018 Brain and Behavior Young Investigator Award, a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health and Society Scholar Award, a K-12 NIH Career Development Award, and in 2017, she was named a National Academy of Sciences Frontiers of Science Fellow for Distinguished Young Scientists Under 45. So in addition to her research, Dr. Jacobs' lab advocates for diversity in science at the national and the international level. Her lab regularly partners with K to 12 groups throughout the Central Coast to advance the girls' representation in STEM, work that was actually featured in the book, STEMists, the life work of 12 women scientists and engineers. Her fun fact is that she was a passenger on a boat that sailed around the world when she was only 12 years old, which I think was, I mean, that's just cool. That's so cool. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Jacobs for joining us. You're muted. Sorry, there we go. 
<laughs> would help. Um, well, thank you so much for having me, um, Lisa and, and the whole group. It's been so fun to be, um, you know, participating in some of these uh, conferences and, and it's really an honor to, to now join as a speaker. Um, so I'm gonna share some work happening um, down the coast a little bit at UCSB um, in work in my lab. So this particular talk is titled Functional Reorganization of Brain Networks Across the Human Menstrual Cycle. So, you know, this is preaching to the choir, which is why it's so fun to talk to this group because um, you all know why we're here and the importance of this. Okay, I gotta just move my screen so I can see all of you. Um, but I think it's worth you know, kind of considering that when we talk about the scientific body of knowledge, whose body does that serve? Um, and as you know, most of what we know about health and disease is centered on the male body. Um, in the United States, before the passage of the 1993 uh, NIH Revitalization Act, most clinical trials were conducted exclusively in men. And as Annalise Beery and Irv Zucker and many others have shown uh, through pioneering survey projects, we know that most preclinical animal studies continue to be conducted in males, um, even in animal models of human disorders that are more prevalent in women, um, like Alzheimer's disease, anxiety, and depression. This particular special issue came out, um, special issue of science came out 15 years ago. I was starting graduate school and I was really struck by um, by this particular image, but also by what it was trying to convey. I thought it was reflecting this kind of emerging awareness that sex and gender matter for understanding health and disease. And in a recent special issue of Frontiers of Neuroendocrinology, edited by our own Dr. Galea, um, you know, we make the case that we need to move beyond sex differences, right? It's time to shine a spotlight on women's brain health as a phenomenon worthy of exploration in and of itself. Uh, you know, we know that neuroscience has overlooked aspects of the human condition specific to women, like the menstrual cycle, hormonal contraceptives, pregnancy, and menopause. And we are a group that is focused on this, but sort of stepping back and thinking about, um, you know, our field as a whole, it is still woefully understudied. Here's just one example. Um, this was a survey um, some of my students did. Um, so I'm speaking specifically about my field of human brain imaging and the status quo um, for human brain imaging studies interested in the aging brain is to enroll adults who are 65 and older. Right? So classical kind of chronological aging um, studies. But this means that the field has largely failed to consider the effects of, say, endocrine aging during the midlife transition to menopause, right? despite the fact that this is a phenomenon that is relevant to half the world's population. Um, these biases extend beyond menopause, right? We know that human neuroimaging studies have largely overlooked other phenomena like the menstrual cycle, hormonal contraceptives, and pregnancy. And these can give us a really fascinating window into the tightly coupled relationship between our endocrine and nervous system. So even from just a basic science perspective, I think um, we've, we've made some unforced errors here. Um, so broadly speaking, my lab um, uses human brain imaging techniques uh, to understand how sex steroid hormones shape the structural and functional architecture of the human brain. We've got a lot of fun work um, that, that we've done and that's underway. I do not have time to touch on even a tenth of it here, but I wanted, in case anybody's interested and you want to chat offline, I wanted to just kind of like briefly mention some of the work that we're doing. Um, I started out in this gig in graduate school fascinated by estradiol's impact on neuromodulatory systems, so in particular dopamine, um, and we've got some molecular pet imaging um, studies underway with collaborators at Berkeley to explore this link directly. Um, we are uh, interested in the impact of reproductive senescence on memory systems um, and uh, just got a, a grant that that's my dream study to look at the impact of hormone suppression um, using a GnRH um, uh, uh, agonist to essentially flip the light switch on HPG axis um, to study the effects of hormone suppression on brain mood and cognition. But today, I'm gonna focus on um, a study that we lovingly refer to as the 28andMe project. And this is trying to understand variation um, in the brain over the female reproductive cycle. So 
as you all know, the brain is an endocrine organ. I can mean that in a lot of different ways. The you know brain ha produces neurosteroids, um, but it is also the target of um, gonadal hormones. Um, so this is the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, the HPG axis, which represents the interaction between our brain and reproductive endocrine system. And of course, there's this, this beautiful, tightly coordinated neuroendocrine cascade in which the hypothalamus regulates the production of estradiol and progesterone from the ovaries. Um, this is usually a slide that's really important to my human cognoro folks who don't really think about the brain in this way. Of course, all of you already know this. Um, you know, there's been a sort of a spotlight of attention paid on um, sex hormones role in prefrontal cortex and in the hippocampus over the last 15 to 20 years, right? So medial temporal lobe regions and the prefrontal cortex we know contain significant populations of estrogen receptors. And from animal studies um, conducted for many of you here, we know that estradiol influences the synaptic organization of these regions. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't show some foundational work um, in the 90s from folks like Catherine Woolley linking changes in hippocampal spine density to estrocycle stage, um, you know, showing clear changes coincident with peaks in estradiol um, across the four to five day rodent cycle. Um, John Morrison's group now at UC Davis has shown historically that estrogen receptor alpha is present in nearly half of all axis finest synapses in monkey prefrontal cortex. Um, he's even shown that, that in some cases the abundance of ER alpha in the prefrontal cortex correlates with performance on a delayed response task. So these, you know, I, I'm, I am rushing through through the sort of whole animal world, but together these sorts of studies really established estradiol as a neuromodulator of learning and memory. Um, I'm going to briefly share a, a fun collaboration that I am doing um, with my partner in life, partner in crime. Um, so my husband, Michael Gord, and his lab at UCSB has developed techniques for high resolution structural and functional imaging of hippocampal neurons using two photon in awake mice. And so um, they've been as one of their sort of first first um, projects using um, this technique, they've been tracking spines on apical dendrites of CA1 neurons over several weeks. So Catherine's work, Woolley's work is amazing. It's also cross-sectional. Um, and so sort of an open question is whether we can see these same ebb and flow of spines in an awake behaving mice chronically recorded. Um, and in fact, chronically recording the exact same dendrites um, as they come in a uh, segment of the dendrite. Um, so they're, they're imaging neurons over several weeks and they found um, a growth in spines during proesterous, increased pruning during estrus that was consistent with Woolley's classic results. So here's how they do it briefly. They're using an implanted microprism to image the hippocampus. It's sort of like a, a submarine periscope that's flipped upside down so you can see the whole hippocampal circuit including CA1, 3, dentate gyrus um, at cellular resolution. And um, in a, a project led by their student, uh, Nora Wolcott, they wanted to see whether changes across the estrus cycle um, were present. So they've been tracking spines on apical dendrites of CA1 neurons over several weeks. Um, they are imaging female mice every 12 hours for eight days. And at each time point, uh, Nora's been taking vaginal cytology and then she developed something that she's calling EstrusNet. Um, so it's a machine learning classifier to stage the mice. Uh, so this is all done blind. Um, and she's got a, a paper coming out. Um, Lisa, you're probably getting a draft of this soon <laughs> um, to, to show that this is actually um, as good, if not better, than, um, than kind of human coding. Um, so, and it, the advantage is, of course, that it's blind. And so then they're comparing the dendritic segment um, uh, by cycle stage. And what they found is um, that there is an increase in uh, spine proliferation and it's by spine type. Um, during proesterous, there's increased pruning during estrus, which is consistent with Woolley's classic results. So there's about a 15% change in spines between these two extremes. I guess I should show the conglomerate. Um, so spine density is highest during proesterous, lowest during estrus. And then the critical question, this is sort of proof of concept, right? We knew that this was the case from the cross-sectional findings, but can we recapitulate these results um, uh, chronically? And in fact, they did. 
But now what's the, the significance, um, sort of functional significance of this finding? And so the next step is to see how these spine changes change the functional properties of hippocampal neurons. One of the ways they're doing this is to image calcium activity in transgenic G-camp mice while they navigate in a floating chamber. So you can see that they have to keep the mouse head fixed, um, but they're still awake behaving, and so they move the chamber around the mice so they can still navigate. Um, and what they're, they're doing is then mapping place fields throughout the cycle to see how place field remapping is influenced by estrus stage. Um, and I won't go into more details. You can just have Mike give the talk on that. But I thought it was a fun way to, to sort of um, prelude into what my lab studies, which is similar phenomenon on a totally different scale. This is using uh, kind of human brain imaging techniques. So um, this project 28andMe was really led and the, the brainchild of a brilliant graduate student, Laura Pritchett, um, along with Tyler Santander and Caitlin Taylor, two postdocs. Um, so, in this case, um, we are really interested in um, endocrine dynamics across the human menstrual cycle. And we know that a central feature of the mammalian endocrine system is that hormone secretion varies over time. It ebbs and flows. And for most women, for most of our lives, this is, you know, kind of as steady as the tides. Um, during an average human menstrual cycle, women experience about an eightfold increase in estradiol, about an 80-fold increase in progesterone. Notice the different scales, of course. Um, but despite this, this pretty striking change in endocrine status, we human neuroimagers really lack a complete understanding of how the brain responds to these rhythmic changes in hormone production. And that's in part because, um, you know, the study of brain hormone interactions in human neuroscience is um, reliance mostly on cross-sectional designs that really just can't capture these rhythmic changes. Um, and, but, you know, we capitalized on sort of this emerging trend in human brain imaging, which is to flip that cross-sectional model on its head and instead to densely sample small numbers of individuals over timescales of days, weeks, months, even years to provide greater insight into the dynamic properties of the human brain. So this 28andMe project was designed to determine how this rhythmicity of hormones um, production shapes the human brain. So our participant underwent daily uh, blood draws um, and MRI every 24 hours for 30 consecutive days across a complete menstrual cycle. She did it a second time a year later, and I'm happy to report that we're halfway through a new participant who's um, a, another woman who's um, doing the same thing now, and we wrapped last month a densely sampled male trying to target diurnal variation in testosterone. So lots of stuff coming down the pipeline. Um, but what are we finding with this technique? Um, well, one of the, we were sort of interested in, in roughly two different aspects. So the first one is using what's called a resting state scan. So the individual is lying in the scanner with her eyes opened and her mind at rest, and we can recapitulate these really kind of canonical, what we call functional brain networks. She had a 3D printed um, foam head case to basically eliminate all um, potential motion artifacts, which is really important for this kind of scan. So you can see that she had fewer than 130 microns of motion on average each day. We parcellated her brain um, into different nodes, and then we calculated um, sort of a functional coherence. Um, so a measure of kind of functional connectivity between these nodes. And just at the sort of basic level, so looking at day-to-day -day correlations, um, what we found is that increases in estradiol over time are associated with greater functional co connectivity pretty much across the whole cortex, right? Across the whole brain. Um, we can uh, increase the threshold a little bit here so you can see here is the association with estradiol. So these are time synchronous associations between estradiol and this measure of functional brain co coherence. Um, so here, hotter colors in, uh, indicate that increased coherence with higher concentrations of estradiol. Cooler colors would indicate the reverse. Um, so what you can see here is that in contrast to estradiol's, let's say, proliferative effects, um, progesterone was primarily associated with reduced coherence across the whole brain. 
we can then parcel the brain, you know, in those into those nodes into known functional networks. You might have heard of something like the default mode network, um, the dorsal attention network. So these are functionally defined networks of the brain, and we can see, you know, how do these associations hold when we look at it by functional network? And you can see, you know, some are sort of stronger than others. So um, the association between estradiol and these uh, coherence measures, but it's pretty much true across these networks. Um, but a critical question is like, what's driving what? These are, you know, what I've presented to you so far is just correlational, but we can take advantage of the fact that this is a densely sampled, right? This is a time series data set. Um, so we can use time lagged methods from dynamical systems analysis to test the temporal directionality of these associations. So are they directed in time? Is it that estradiol is changing resting state functional connectivity or is it the other way around? So we can use something called vector autoregression models, VAR models to just solve simple equations. So is today's resting state functional connectivity um, best explained by yesterday's brain state, yesterday's estradiol concentrations, or then we can go two orders back um, and vice versa. We can solve for estradiol in the same way. Long story short, what we find it very clearly, there is a unidirectional association. It is past states of estradiol driving increases in functional coherence and not the other way around. So we see these same associations, if anything, they're even more robust when we take into account lagged effects of estradiol. Um, we can, you know, kind of keep digging in. So here we're borrowing methods from graph theory. So we are, we can characterize, this is the default mode network. These are the nodes in the network, and we can characterize the strength of of um, connectivity within the nodes of this network. So it's a measure called um, global efficiency. And so this is essentially asking how well integrated, integrated are the nodes of a particular network. And this is what we find. So here's, I should state that this is graphed by day of experiment, not day of, of the cycle. Um, so this is ovulation here, the peak, and you can see estradiol is peaking here and then shows the classic kind of precipitous fall. And what we see strikingly is that um, there's sort of a one day lag. So after estradiol peaks, we see this increase in efficiency in default mode, and then it plummets right along with the plummet of estradiol. Um, so default mode network efficiency is really driven by previous states of estradiol. You know, we still had, you know, we were really excited to kind of dig into this data set, but we really still had questions about how hormones were shaping large scale functional brain network reorganization, like which particular nodes in the brain are driving this network reorganization and how do they reorganize? And so to address this, um, two students, Josh Mueller from physics and Laura Pritchett, again, teamed up to use methods from complex systems analysis. So these are the same kinds of methods that um, physicists use to like map wildfire spreads, um, for example. Um, so it's dynamic community detection, and we can identify periods of time when functionally coupled regions of the brain begin to shift their network community. So this is a, a measure we're calling um, network flexibility. And here we just bin it by gross estrous cycle or uh, menstrual cycle stage. So follicular, um, ovulatory, and luteal. What you can find, see is that um, during the ovulatory period, coincident with peak levels of estradiol, there's a much greater kind of flexibility in, in the brain, if you will. And then we can look at this as an actual time series so that you can see by functional networks, um, this measure of network flexibility mapped on to the changes in hormones. And what you're seeing is that, you know, actually most functional networks are highly stable over the menstrual cycle. So for example, you can see the visual network here, um, but there are some in particular, like the default mode network, the limbic network, um, that show noticeably higher degrees of flexibility during this ovulatory period. Um, there's actually, um, in some cases, a secondary peak coincident with a secondary peak in estradiol um, in the luteal phase. And how am I doing on time? Because I actually don't, I'm, I'm two minutes? Two minutes, yeah. Okay, so perfect. I'm just gonna wrap up. Um, so the other thing that we were interested in was of course, um, brain structures. So this is work led by uh, my postdoc, Caitlin Taylor, and we use high resolution hippocampal subfield imaging protocols to basically look at um, how these hippocampal subfield volumes also change um, in coordination with sex steroid hormones. I will 
just uh, cut to the chase and, and say that we found progesterone dependent effects um, in the first study. So correlations between progesterone and volume. And so to really kind of make sure what we were seeing was real, we repeated the study a year later. This time the participant was on a selective progesterone antagonist. So you can see that in the second study, progesterone levels were, were squashed by 97%. Um, if I change the scale, you can see some modulation, but of course it's much less on the whole than this one. And so what we found is that in a naturally cycling state, there were subfields um, that were, um, so subfields, hippocampal subfield CA23, pair hippocampal cortex, when progesterone levels rose, we saw an increase in volume in these regions. Um, so this is the same thing mapped as a scatter plot versus the, the box plots. But under the hormonally suppressed state, so study two, um, this uh, modulation went away. So proliferative effects of progesterone on CA23 parahippocampal cortex. Um, but we saw opposite effects in other regions like the perirhinal cortex and the interrhinal cortex, um, showing in fact the opposite effect. Um, and if you look across studies, there were um, pretty striking differences in volume in the naturally cycling state versus in the hormonally suppressed state. Um, and I will, I can answer questions on that, but I'll just kind of skip through. But what this is showing, I think, for the, for perhaps like at the highest temporal resolution so far in humans, that these, um, these subfields are sensitive to sex steroid hormones. Um, of course, this is what the animal literature has said all along, but now we're looking at it at this sort of mesoscopic scale of, um, you know, uh, that we can measure with human MRI, high resolution human MRI. Um, you know, in hormonal regulation of regions like the entorhinal cortex that we know are um, some of the first cortical regions to be targeted in the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, we're kind of interested in understanding um, the, the functional significance of these findings. And um, that's uh, kind of leading into the study that we're launching next month, which is using a drug called Alagalax, which is a GnRH um, uh, modulator to induce essentially chemical castration in women chronically for three months um, to understand scanning them pre and post treatment to understand how in young healthy women um, kind of endocrine aging can affect the brain and I can get into the details of how we're able to do that um, if you want. And just final slide, um, we are interested in addition to our kind of in-house lab studies um, to build larger um, brain imaging initiatives and we are part of the University of California, the, the sort of mothership, a 10 campus network. And so we are building um, a large scale open access database dedicated specifically unabashedly towards advancing women's health. There's been a number of these big brain imaging initiatives. You might have heard of Human Connectome Project, but to me, strikingly, none have been done with women's health at the forefront. So we've already rolled out at UCSB in Berkeley, and we're building um, efforts across the 10 UC campus. So stay tuned for that and reach out if you if you want to be part of it. <laughs> um, and I will just end there thanking all of the members of my lab, the many collaborators. Um, as Lisa said, um, you know, it's I'm so such a bummer that we can't be in person. Um, and I would just extend the invitation for any of you that might be in Santa Barbara, please come by and say hi. We would love to see you. Um, the lab's great fun. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll take questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Jacobs, for an am amazing talk. Um, we do have some, a question in the chat. So we have about two minutes for questions. Um, Natalie, do you wanna ask your own question? Or do you for me to read it. Sure, I can ask it. Um, I just want to thank you for your amazing uh, work and really important work. Just wondering if you think that maybe there's a connection between the increased flexibility um, seen in certain networks like DMN and limbic during ovulation and whether it could underlie maladaptive plasticity that happens or might lead to certain conditions that are more prevalent in women like mood disorders or chronic pain. That's a really good question. And that's, you know, 
there's there's so many questions that got raised from this study and what we did not do is a lot we did do mood sampling but this is a healthy um woman not predisposed to like pmdd or some kinds of, of of mood disorders and so what i would really love to do is expand this dense sampling design nih are you listening <laughs> to include women who are at risk of um, mood disorders to, to really try to understand exactly that question um, we are, I will say, we did just wrap, um, as a pilot study, a densely sampled um, woman over pregnancy starting two weeks before, every two weeks during pregnancy, up to six months post, and we see incredibly striking changes within limbic um, regions, so this is following the HEXIMA study, looking pre-post pregnancy, where we're, we're able to link those changes and show in what trimester those changes are happening and link it to um, to actually the sex the you know, the kind of endocrine modulators of that. We were sort of holding onto those data because we want to repeat it in, in a couple more women before we put it out. But, um, you know, one of my, my thoughts on, on turning that into a, a grant is trying to target women who may be at risk of postpartum depression and are we seeing kind of endocrine drivers of that um, risk of a mood disorder. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I do, I want to talk to you after about that. I know. I, I, I want to pick your brain deeply. <laughs> <laughs> I'm study, trying, to, trying to do a study with uh, functional mirrors across pregnancy. So we have a lot. Okay. Afterwards. <laughs> Dr. Davidge, would you like to share your screen? So our next speaker is Dr. Sandy Davidge. She's the executive director of the Women's and Children's Health Research Institute a distinguished university professor at the University of Alberta. She's also a fellow in the Canadian Academy of Health Science. Dr. Davidge serves on many national and international grant panels and is currently on the editorial board for hypertension and the American Journal of Physiology and Biology of Sex Differences. As well as she is the board chair for the National Maternal, Infant, Child, Youth and Research Network. Dr. Davidge's research program encompasses studying cardiovascular function as it relates to one, complications in pregnancy, such as preeclampsia and maternal aging, and two, developmental origins of adult cardiovascular disease. With her team of trainees, for whom she has mentored over 40 national and international graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, Dr. Davidge has published over 250 original peer-reviewed manuscripts and review articles in these areas. And she's currently funded by the CHR Foundation Scheme Program. And her fun fact is that she lives on acreage in Stony Plain with her husband and her two horses and two dogs. And during COVID, uh, she's been able to ride daily with her horses. So that's that's fantastic. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Great. Thank you, Cindy. I forgot I had sent in the fun facts, but still riding every day, which is good. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for putting on the, the symposium across the whole year, but also for today and especially to Lisa. That was great to invite me to this and I really appreciate it. I just wish we were there having nice dinners and a glass of wine at the end, but here we are. Um, Emily, you did a great job in uh, introducing women's health, which is great. And I have lots of questions and mine's more about postmenopausal brain, but we can talk about that later. So that'd be great. Um, so I'm here switching gears. We set this up. So we have the cycling talk and then we have a pregnancy talk with cardiovascular and then back to the brain. So I'm completely switching gears here to, uh, to talk to you in 20 minutes or less about the impact of pregnancy complications on both on maternal and offspring cardiovascular health. And I think this is um, an important area be, uh, because we're all a product of placenta. So I think that's something to message a lot that women's health is about family health, is about population health. So it's to have that conversation. And, and I do think it's really important what you said that you know, we can study the women's brain just for the sake of understanding the women's brain. So I, I, I hope we can change um, how we do things as we progress through um, training the world that's good to know about women's health. Oops, sorry. I figure out how to move forward. It's not moving. Oh, hold on. Not sure why I'm not getting the next slide. Sorry, guys. Here we go. I'll just have to select, select each slide. Anyway, so the um, 
pregnancy, fascinating physiological condition. And I'm speaking to Cindy here, who's about to have a baby again. Um, and it's a physiological tour de force on every aspect of every organ, including the brain. And I'm not talking about that today because that's not my area of expertise. But from a vascular point of view, it's an amazing changes and adaptations that occur where there's an increase of blood volume of 1.5 fold, which would never be able to be occurred in a non-pregnant body. Greater cardiac output, uh, blood pressure though, is actually normal or reduced. So there has to be some vascular remodeling, some vascular vasodilation to accommodate for these tremendous cardiovascular changes that must occur in order for the placental perfusion and, and nutrients to the fetus. So there's a dramatic reduction in peripheral vascular resistance that occurs in pregnancy. And it's what we've been studying to understand those pathways over the you know, last few decades, but also um, what can occur when um, these adaptations don't occur properly. And that's in a condition called preeclampsia. So preeclampsia, um, and many of you probably already know this, but I have a diverse audience that probably focuses more on the brain. So I'll just do a quick definition. It is the de novo onset of hypertension and evidence of end organ damage. It used to be proteinuria, definition changes, because it's a syndrome. It's a syndrome of symptoms. Um, and this occurs in late pregnancy after the 20 weeks of gestation. It's actually quite prevalent. It affects five to 7% of all pregnancies and is the leading cause of maternal and neonatal morbidity and mortality. and really has dramatic effects on maternal death um, worldwide. So even though many of us have been studying it for decades, that has been studied for um, centuries, we still don't have a treatment. And the only definitive treatment is, is delivery of the baby. So the, um, to keep it simple, one thing that's actually quite um, unique is that um, to have preeclampsia, you have both. You have both a, a placental origin and a maternal influence. And we know the placenta is involved and there's reduced viral artery invasion and reduced perfusion. But you also need the maternal um, influences because you do see uh, small placentas, intrauterine growth restriction occurring where, where the woman does not develop preeclampsia. So it is a combination of the two and it sets up um, as a first defense of a vascular endothelial cell dysfunction. Um, I don't know how to, oh, there we go. Sorry, now I know how to work my slides with the two screens. <laughs> um, but does this have an impact later in life? And that's the key here is that um, there's a lot of influences that are happening. You have to have a vasodilation, um, but something's happening at the level of placenta and, the, and what kind of impact is that having later in life? So this has been um, known for a number of years now that there is the timing by which pregnancy is a window uh, to a future cardiovascular risk. And this is critically important. And what is now known that there's a four times risk of cardiovascular and cerebral vascular disease later in life. And just recently, and this is what's amazing, um, we've known about this for a while. It takes so long to translate knowledge to policy. The American Heart Association just put out a scientific statement in circulation to re-emphasize this. It's in the uh, American, Heart Line, American Heart Guidelines, um, and we're just now changing Canadian guidelines. So it's, a, um, it's important, I think, that we translate our knowledge, not only for changing policy and guidelines, but also to our clinical colleagues that take care of these women. And there's actually very few postpartum um, clinics for women uh, um, as related to cardiovascular health. So it's a real problem translating our knowledge to, to actual um, the, the, the system that takes care of these women. But what's actually quite interesting is that there's a higher risk during the first 10 years after the pregnancy. Pregnancy is in younger women, healthy younger women, we hope most of the time. So why are they getting cardiovascular risk? So why are we seeing these cardiovascular risks so many, so um, close so when we talk about increased cardiovascular risk, it's not about increasing cardiovascular risk when they're 80 years old. It's increasing cardiovascular risk um, within 10 years after the pregnancy. So one of the questions that have been um, debated is whether or not pregnancy is a stress test that reveals the cardiovascular risk for women. And for the longest time, that has been the statement. It's just been a statement. You know, if you see that the woman has preeclampsia, that's been the pregnancy is a stress test, and it is. You need healthy vasculature to have that vas vasodilation. Um, but one of the questions we had, could the complicated pregnancy itself impact vascular function and persist later in life? 
And I think it's important to have this distinction because it makes a difference in how we um, follow these women, how we treat these women, how we identify these women, and know that every woman in there that may have had a complicated pregnancy does have an increased risk. And in order to do this, we had a few questions. There's different there is no real animal model preeclampsia. We all create those models in our different tools that we have. So the, uh, the one thing that is very unique and distinct and consistent in preeclampsia is the dyslipidemia that it follows along with it. So even though um, preeclampsia is a multi-system disorder, there's also dyslipidemia in pregnancy that's not associated with preeclampsia, but as it relates to women preeclampsia, you can see here that L so these are lipids in women preeclampsia compared to controls. You can see that LDL is much higher, HDL is lower, total cholesterol is, total cholesterol is higher, as well as triglycerides. So there is dyslipidemia in women um, that is shown in women who have been diagnosed with preeclampsia. We also know from what I just told you pre in the previous slides that we have metastatic dysfunction and the increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So the question that we've been working on is whether or not the dyslipidemia and the complicated pregnancy can actually impair maternal um, later life cardiovascular health. So this is a study being done currently. This is um, still not yet published. So we're trying to give you current data um, with Tamara uh, Sayez, who is a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. And where she used a mouse model where she, in the second half of pregnancy, she fed these animals a high cholesterol diet. And then we had, um, and then we study them postpartum three months later. Then we had the never pregnant animals, so the non-pregnant, but we've gone back and forth how to use the terminology because when you're postpartum, you're not pregnant either. <laughs> so they're all not pregnant by the time we study them. Um, so we're gonna start calling these never pregnant and the liparis is another way. They also had the high cholesterol diet for that one week. And for these animal model studies, usually you're giving these high cholesterol diets for like four months, six months. And then you're looking at atherosclerotic risk, risk, um, risks with atherosclerosis. So most of the model systems, no one ever gives the diet just for a week because it's not enough of a time frame in general in non-pregnant and usually in male mouse model. And I, I agree with it completely, Emily, so much has been done in male model animal systems that we don't even know much about the female non-pregnant system. And then we study vascular function and we do this by isolating um, uh, arteries. In this case, we're studying the aortics. We're looking at atherosclerosis risk and we study them in an isolated vascular system. So this is what a vasodilation curve looks like in our isolated vascular system, where you look at percent vasodilation with increasing concentrations. In this case, we use acetylcholine analog methacholine to show endothelial dependent relaxation. This is just showing that for all groups of animals, if you inhibit the nitric oxide pathway, that this aortas are predominantly using the nitric oxide pathway for vasodilation. So just so um, if you're looking at mechanisms. What I really want to point out is the four groups by which we look at the capacity for the vascular system of vasodilate. The black are the never pregnant, the red are the postpartum, the squares are the high cholesterol diet. And look at this, one week of high cholesterol diet during pregnancy studied three months later, the impaired endothelial dependent re relaxation is just tremendous. We don't normally see this in, in, in any of our models. So we were actually uh, amazingly shocked. Yet you, set, you do the same diet for one week in a non-pregnant animal that's never pregnant, you don't see this. And we wouldn't have expected that. But this interaction between pregnancy and a um, high cholesterol diet in, in order to create a dyslipidemia, again, we're, we're trying to study dyslipidemia, the interactions were tremendous, and this is percent vasodilation. So now you look at how does this increase risk and what could those risks be? So um, we looked at oxidized LDL as a, because we also are interested in the selectin-like oxidized LDL receptor I don't have time to talk to you about today, but we used oxidized LDL as a circulating factor that has an effect on dyslipidemia and see what impact this may have. Um, and again, we're interested in specific receptor. You can see again in the control postpartum animals that um, control diet in the 
and postpartum animals that there isn't much effect of oxidized LDL. But look at those animals that have been fed a high cholesterol diet, one week in pregnancy, studied three months later, and look at the impact of the high cholesterol diet. So this is increasing susceptibility, that secondary hit. So you may not even know you have um, complications until you actually have a secondary hit, in this case, um, uh, changes in, in, um, in your liver profile as you age. So this just shows the significant uh, difference there. So as demonstrated in the animal model, we showed actually that the complication itself per se can result in later life dysfunction. And this has really changed. Um, we've been championing this for a while that it, it, I think as we approach women and understanding it, that we need to understand this both. You have both the pregnancy as a stress test. We also know that the pregnancy itself, if it's complicated, may actually impact vascular function. And that dyslipidemia could contribute to the persistent um, endothelial cell dysfunction postpartum. And it has important influences on later life cardiovascular health for women. The problem is, is that the incidence of severe preeclampsia is actually increasing instead of decreasing because we don't have a treatment and we have more risk factors going into pregnancy for women now with Western diet, uh, reproductive technologies, the comorbidities, more obesity and advanced maternal age. So one of the things that we've, and the, and the advanced maternal age is increasing for a number of factors, some are socioeconomic, but you can see here that the incidence of preeclampsia increases tremendously um, with advanced maternal age. So it's combining the preeclampsia work. So does this have an impact on cardiovascular function? And so well, how we define advanced maternal age is that um, women over 35 years of age, so we're not talking about the extreme, we're not talking about the 55 year old woman that happened to get pregnant. It is about uh, one in five live births in North America are from women um, at 35 years of age and 12% are first births. So one of the questions we had was to understand this in, again, an animal model where we can control all the factors that go into it when you age as many factors that are involved in um, affecting vascular function. And then just to give you just a quick snippet about what we've seen in the offspring, just to, again, bring in back that um, the pregnancy and health and that the whole population should, un should, be, should care. So in this case, we use the spray dolly rats aged to about um, 9.5 months of age, which is like 35 years of age in women. So it's not extreme old. Um, they're barely uh, fertile in order for us to get them pregnant. And we assess them for postpartum and the offspring. And again, I'm just going to show quick snippets just to get the concept across, is that in these postpartum age females, now again, studied um, three months later, or in this case, four months later, look at this oxidized LDL. It shifted it tremendously for those animals that had been um, advanced maternal age. If you use the same age uh, criteria, but never pregnant again, that oxidized LDL, if anything, caused more, it caused more relaxation, um, but there was no effect of the oxidized LDL. So again, you can see that postpartum aged dams have a increased susceptibility to secondary hits. And we've sent our brains from this model to Lisa, who's going to study these aged. I know I'm so excited. Um, so hopefully we'll find out more about the brain in these aged postpartum animals. So the last little um, last concept is about the offspring cardiovascular function. What we have seen in our models of developmental origin, so most of it we've been doing has been prenatal hypoxia. So, um, so most of it has been that we looked at hypoxia and then in pregnancy and then look at offspring. But in this case, we had these age dams and we let them have, you know, we had the offspring and we said, oh, well, let's see what happens. And, and one of the things we found in our developmental origins work is that the heart is um, very susceptible to any fetal um, uh, perturbations that we have in our animal models. So what we, what we do is a working heart where we do ischemic reperfusion, similar to what you would have if you had a heart attack. And we look at susceptibility to recover from the ischemic reperfusion insult. And these are male offspring born from the age dam. So their baseline cardiac function is normal. You give the insult of, of stopping flow for, for a very short time, 10 minutes, and then restart flow, again, kind of like a heart attack. And the normal, if you're born from a young dam, you can recover from, your cardio, from this uh, cardiovascular insult. 
but if you're born from an age dam, you weren't able to do that. And that was fascinating to us because this is just, we're not manipulating this model at all. They're just older animals that we're studying um, in the laboratory. And then in the females, we didn't see this. Whereas in the hypoxia and so much more severe, we see this susceptibility to cardiovascular disease, um, both in males and females. So they're different and that's important to distinguish. So adult offspring born from mothers of advanced maternal age in our model system what are more susceptible to the secondary hits that we have in, um, that we did in the laboratory for cardiovascular disease. Um, and that this prenatal environment does impact later life health, but we do need to understand the sex differences, again, of that um, uh, placental um, insult that's occurring. And now, you know, we actually study both male and female placenta. And I was actually talking to a placental pathologist, and they don't actually look at their pathology from males and females. But in the, we see tremendous differences if the placenta is from a fetal from a male fetus versus a female fetus and their capacity to handle secondary insults like oxidative stress. So we, there's so much more to understand about sex differences in pregnancy. So the impact of pregnancy complications does not end with delivery. Preeclampsia can double women's stroke risk and quadruple the high blood pressure. It also can affect um, the fetal development and, and susceptibility. It's not to scare women who are pregnant. Sorry, Cindy. This is about, to, um, about knowing your risk factors and, and going into pregnancy healthier and looking at lifestyles and, 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 and educating and, and acknowledging that we can uh, do more. And this comes back down to precision medicine approaches. Pregnancy history should be a taken into account. Um, into a consideration, your own and your mother's. Um, I moved here from the States, I have two children. I've never had my GP ask me if I had a pregnancy. And if I did, what was my, um, was it a normal pregnancy? Did you have preeclampsia? I never had anybody ever ask me about my pregnancy history and it's not connected to any uh, electronic records here because I didn't live here um, when my babies were born. So I think we need to accurately identify those individuals' resilience um, as much as risk trajectories and optimize intervention with precise and personalized treatment. And there's only a couple of postpartum um, uh, clinics across Canada. We're actually writing a review article right now for the Canadian uh, Journal of Cardiology in order to educate cardiologists that you should be looking at um, some of these risk factors and ask about pregnancy history. So with that, I'd like to end with the um, I, my acknowledgments of, of everyone in my lab. I have a great group. Uh, I should have shown my fun picture. We have some great pictures, but um, here's the, uh, uh, my lab group uh, collaborators, and which can be done. And then of course our funding bodies that would not be able to um, be accomplish the work that we do in this area. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for that talk and very profound final conclusions. Um, we do have, a, um, Emily has a question in the chat. Did you want to read your own question? Oh, or like me too. Yeah, yeah sure, I can stop sharing. So I can, yep. Yeah, hi, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Um, I was wanting to ask about your thoughts about genetic risk of uh, dyslipidemia, um, because from my understanding of cardiovascular risk in women, um, dyslipidemia from my understanding is a lower effect size. It's a, like a less potent risk factor compared to men. But um, I was wondering if you'd investigated genetic models of dyslipidemia in your mice um, and your thoughts on if that would increase preeclampsia risk or early onset yeah. heart disease risk. Great question. Really good question. No, we have. So the simple answer is <laughs> no, we haven't. But it is a great question because um, this was, it, it was fascinating to us. Well, there's, we have other guests here. I love it. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I think it's a great question. No, we haven't. So I don't have that. We were really surprised by the outcome that we had here. We were, you know, we did have that hypothesis, but the the extent by which it really affected the postpartum uh, later in life was just, you know, we I've never seen, we don't see vascular function changes that great to see that three months later. So I, that's a great idea. I'll bring that back to, Tara, to, to Tammy and, um, and talk about that more because, uh, we haven't done anything in that area yet. So great question. Thank you. Um, I have a question if no one else does right now. Um, I, 
the your developmental origins of disease that the model you're using is fascinating. I'm just wondering, do you have any hypotheses as to why it's the male offspring that's showing the cardiac dysfunction and not the females? Because it's quite profound the fact you found. Yeah, no, um, and and like I said, with our epoxy model, they're they're actually the the um, the impact in our epoxy models similar to males and females, but the pathways that are, are impacted are different. So from a calcium handling point of view, um, there's different pathways in the males versus the females, even if the end result's the same. The fact that the males were um, more affected here in the aging versus the females, I, I think it goes back to the placenta, to tell you the truth. I think it comes back to the susceptibility. So we actually, um, and we've published this with collaborators in, in Cambridge, where we sent them all our age placentas, and they looked at many, many aspects um, on that. And then, um, and I wish I had that summary in front of me about the male and female differences. But some of it has to do with susceptibility to oxidative stress within the placenta. The female placentas tend to have more superoxide dismutase, that's more protective, and that's been shown in human placenta as well. So some of it comes back, back to that, but it also may come back to the adult animal too. So I don't know the, so I think it's more developmental starting at the placenta level, but it could be also at the adult level that there's more resilience of, of uh, female hearts, um, some because of the hormonal cycles that you see there. Because uh, again, these are only four months old. These are reproductive aged animals. So some of it is the susceptibility, but going back to Emily's point uh, we don't, as we're studying this, we go back to the literature and say, okay, what do we know about the male heart? So there's like thousands of people measuring the male heart. And there's so little literature on this isolated heart system in female um, models. So I can't go back and sit there and say, well, so what was it about pregnancy? Because we know this about the female heart because there's so little known about the female heart. It's really um, a, a, a gap that we need to address. Can I just follow up on that? Um, uh, so much to follow up on, and I'm trying not because I have to <laughs> you know, my own talk, but um, uh, for both questions for both Emily and Sandy, but um, I know uh, I know it's hard. That's why you need the dinner and the wine. Anyway, um, exactly. Uh, so you said four months old because that was something that I uh, missed. But now I'm wondering. I mean, of course, this is why you have uh, many, many students and postdocs that go on and take this on as a career question. But, you know, I wonder if the same differences in susceptibility or differences in um, your measures might change as they age, right? So you talked about that, you know, they're still sort of young and reproductive, but what happens in middle age and what happens if you um, stress a system later with a high cholesterol diet or something, maybe you'll see differences between the sexes there too. Be interesting. Exactly. And, and, and then the susceptibility of that. So you have a young dam with a female offspring um, looking normal at 10 months, but maybe these um, offspring born from the age dam at 10 months may be more. Because a lot of what we've seen is exactly that. It's more about the susceptibility to a secondary hit. So the, most of our animal models that we studied, they look fine. They look in the cage. They look fine. It's just when you go to give a some sort of stressor whether it be a ischemic insult for an isolated heart or um, a, a high fat diet. Um, we've done that postpartum as well on the developmental origins work we do. So it's really about that um, setting the stage for increased susceptibility, not necessarily the first insult being the worst. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna have to sh uh, stop our chat, unfortunately, we can uh, continue on. Uh -huh. um, but Lisa, if you could share your screen. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Glia. She leads the Women's Health Research Cluster, um, and she's a professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of British Columbia. She's a health advisor to the Vice VPRI, a member of the Center for Brain Health, and a scientific advisor at the Women's Health Research Institute. Her research investigates how sex hormones influence brain health and disease in both females and males, and the, male, the main goal of her research is to improve brain health for women and for men by examining the influence of sex and sex hormones on normal and diseased brain states, such as depression and Alzheimer's disease. And her fun fact, and I'm surprised I didn't know this, I've known Lisa for a long time. She co-wrote and co-directed two musicals in high school. Wow, woman of many talents. Yeah, well, it was a long time ago. <laughs> 
So, <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much. I'm gonna spend the next 20 minutes talking about some of the work that uh, we've been doing and actually Cindy has done <laughs> on uh, how pregnancy affects uh, brain health long-term. So it's very obvious in a number of ancient cultures that the pregnant and fertile woman was revered. And then I think we went through a dark period in our history where uh, women were sequestered during pregnancy and not seen. And then I'm gonna blame Demi Moore who posed on the cover, cover of Vanity Fair magazine in all her pregnant glory in 1991. And now you can't go out a pre-COVID checkout stand without seeing the latest celebrity um, in their very tight fitting outfits uh, while they're pregnant. And they look amazing and glamorous and gorgeous. And you could be forgiven for thinking that pregnancy is an amazing thing. And I do think you get an amazing present at the end of pregnancy, don't get me wrong, but I thought I'd share with you the worst picture of me ever taken in my life to prove the point that actually takes a huge toll on a woman's body. And, and, and Sandy did talk about this quite a bit already. Um, there's a whole field of research about how a, a, a person's body has to allow for fetal growth. And I'm going to pick on um, uh, hormones, as a matter of fact. So cortisol, the main stress hormone, increases about two times normal levels during a human pregnancy. Progesterone is 20 times normal levels. But, uh, you know, I know we're not supposed to pick favorites, but I do have a favorite hormone. And estradiol is 200 times normal levels by week 20, 300 times by week 30. And then it goes up to 1,000 times normal levels just prior to uh, parturition or birth. And these are not short acute periods of time. We're talking about months and months and months of exposure to these very high levels of hormones. And that what happens with birth and the expulsion of the placenta is that women are actually hypogonadal uh, for about six months following uh, birth. So it maybe shouldn't be so surprising that these physiological changes that occur during pregnancy might be implicated in both short and long-term changes to health. And I'm going to talk about how timing and parity might matter for neuroplasticity, the immune environment, how parity might change the trajectory of brain aging, and how it interacts with estrogens, genotype, and disease in middle age. I know a lot to fit in in, in 20 minutes. So why might reproductive experience or parity alter the likelihood? I'm going to be talking about Alzheimer's disease a little bit towards the end. Um, or any disease, how, how might it affect it later on in life? I talked a little bit about steroid hormones already, it could be this exposure. Um, and uh, it could be though about neuroplasticity, which I'll show you, uh, the immune systems changes, of course, metabolism changes, and uh, we only have just started to look at some of these effects. And then uh, there could be something uh, akin to fetal mycochimerism that might be altering some, some uh, susceptibility. And I'll talk about some of these uh, uh, in turn. Now I'm a neuroscientist, so I, I'm obsessed with a certain region and the region that I'm obsessed with is hippocampus because it's important for memory and emotion. You see a volume decline with Alzheimer's disease. It's actually the first area uh, to experience a volume decline once diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And you see changes with reproductive experience, which I'll talk about. It's affected by both sex and stress hormones, lots of these receptors throughout the hippocampus. And it's very plastic in adulthood. And the plasticity I study is neurogenesis. You can visualize these new neurons that are being produced in a variety of ways using an endogenous protein like double cortin or using an exogenous marker, a DNA synthesis marker like bromodeoxyuridine. And uh, the female brain itself shows a lot of plasticity with reproductive experience. So in humans, you actually see a big decline in volume, about 6%, and the zero here is parturition or birth. Uh, and you can see it bounces back to preconception levels later. Uh, but other people have found gray matter volume differences in a variety of reasons, and I'm going to show you that data. Um, but uh, uh, Pylon Kim has shown that you see increases in other regions. So it could be some region-specific uh, influences, and timing obviously matters. If you're looking from here to here, you're going to see a decrease. But if you're looking from here to here, you might see an increase. So it's something to consider when you're looking at the literature. In terms of rodents, we've seen hippocampal size decreases during pregnancy. Uh, I'm going to show you some of this data, but dendritic uh, complexity changes as well as neurogenesis uh, during the postpartum period. But in other areas, such as the severin circular zone, and those cells migrate into the factory bulbs and rodents, that actually increases with pregnancy. So again, region-specific effects. 
So here's the findings from Paxima's data. She did this a while ago, but you can see a number of different regions here that show a decline. And this blue uh, shaded area here is pregnancy. So they have a time point prior to pregnancy, two months after pregnancy, and then two years later. And of course, my favorite region we're going to highlight. And you can see that uh, there's a partial recovery in volume, but the, still that the, the reduction is still seen even two years later. Now, in the studies that um, we've been doing, uh, we look at a variety of timelines. And, and first of all, I'll say that we use nulliparous animals that's never pregnant, primiparous one litter, biparous two litters. Sometimes we use multiparous animals. Um, and we look at various time points. So we look during pregnancy in the postpartum. We look at um, uh, significantly past, I'd say, a weaning. So at least a week past the, the time that pups have left the nest. Um, and we look at middle age. And so these are significant time periods after they've given birth. And our, our outcome variables are inflammation, sometimes neuroinflammation, sometimes peripheral. Well, I'll show you a little bit of RNA sequencing data. Uh, and we look at neurogenesis and memory as well. So first I thought I'd talk a little bit about pregnancy in the early postpartum. I know I'm supposed to be talking about later in, in life, but I just uh, wanted to show, share some of this data. So uh, along with these other Paris groups, we also sometimes will use a foster uh, dam. So uh, this is when they do just experience the uh, pups only, the offspring only, they don't, they're not actually pregnant, or we have pregnant only groups. And that is to show, do we see effects based on um, the enrichment from the pups or is it pregnancy only that causes these effects? So they've only been pregnant and they don't have any exposure to pups at all. I think probably many of you are familiar with the term baby brain. And you know, does it exist? There are a lot of studies that show yes, and a lot of studies that show no. But it looks like when you look at on body that of evidence, you see that verbal memory in humans declines just during the third trimester. In in rodents, we see that spatial working memory declines just during the third week of pregnancy. And Lara Glynn has shown that it depends on parity. So uh, depending on how many times you've been pregnant, you'll see decrements in verbal memory recall. And Claire Vanston in uh, Neil Watson's lab has shown that fetal sex plays a role. So if you're uh, pregnant with a male, you're more likely to, sh to show a better performance in working memory and spatial tasks than if you're pregnant with a female. So lots of these things can impact these results. Now, looking at neurogenesis is just the birth of these new neurons, in the hippocampus, uh, 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 Jody Paluski looked very early. So this is just 24 hours after giving birth. And, and we looked at whether you saw a change in the birth of these new cells and whether these new cells actually survived to, serve, to, to become new neurons. And what she found was that both primiparous and biparous animals showed a reduction in the number of these new cells. So the potential is much lower. And it was actually only for this early time point, the primiparous animals that showed a reduction in the survival of these new cells. In terms of the foster moms, they showed completely different uh, effects. So they showed an enhancement in both proliferation and survival. And we think that this effect here to reduce a neurogenesis is really driven by pregnancy alone. Jody also looked at learning and memory. So I showed you that, okay, there might be some deficits in the third trimester, but now we're talking about once the pups have left the nest and I'm thinking this is sort of like when the kids can get cereal on their own and they can leave you to sleep for a little bit longer. And then she did this uh, spatial working memory version of the radial alarm maze, which uh, takes about a month to do. And that's about two year equivalent for a rat. So it's actually quite a bit of time. And this is looking at errors here. So looking at reference memory errors and working memory errors, and oh, sorry, I think it slipped down a little bit, but you could hopefully could see then primiparous animals are actually performing better. Um, and, and both uh, Paris animals are performing better on, work on working memory tasks. So while you might have a, an impairment early on, you actually see improvements in learning and memory later. So uh, this is sort of just summing up that part of, part of the talk that I gave you. And now with what happens in middle age, there are some studies that show there's an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease with parity, but there are also studies showing there is not an increased risk. There's actually, it might be protective. We know that heart disease can be increased and it de depends on a number of pregnancy complications, perhaps, or advanced maternal age, as Sandy just talked to us about. Obesity is also uh, a greater risk and all of these things can influence Alzheimer's disease. The other one I should talk about is low hormone levels. So after you've given birth across the menstrual cycle, you actually have lower levels of gonadohormones. And that also has been implicated in uh, Alzheimer's disease risk. 
Now, uh, this, these couple studies came out and uh, they're really fascinating. So this is looking at the UK Biobank, it's Anne-Marie DeLang's work showing using a machine learning prediction paradigm that it didn't matter how many births um, a person had, their brain showed less evident brain aging. And I was thrilled to see that my very favorite region showed up as one of the regions most strongly associated with least brain aging and parity. I was also thrilled because our own work shows something very similar. So uh, this is the work here on the left of Dr. Ran Eid, uh, who just uh, is a postdoc now at McGill University. And she found that permeperous animals, so that's one litter, um, you can see during gestation and the early postpartum and even in the late postpartum, much lower, lower levels of neurogenesis. But something happens at middle age. The trajectory of aging is quite different. It doesn't have that same sort of steep decline, or they show that steep decline a little earlier on. They have many more of these new neurons in, in middle age. And Cindy showed the same thing when uh, she was doing her PhD. This is, she used retired breeders in this dark blue, and you can see many more of these new cells in the hippocampus in middle age. Uh, uh, Dr. Paula Duarte Gooderman, who's now uh, an, a, at Brock University, showed as an assistant professor, uh, showed that um, parity also increased hippocampal cell pro, uh, synaptic proteins. And we looked at PSD95, and it didn't matter when she looked in the postpartum, either after the pups had left the nest or in middle age, you see this increase in both permiparous and viparous animals. And that's kind of the way that you can think of uh, neurons communicating with each other using those synaptic proteins. Cindy also looked at uh, the um, influence of previous parity on uh, working memory, and she used the Morse water maze task. And uh, we used a different rendition of this task. So every two days, we changed the, where the hidden platform was related. They have to go and find that hidden platform, so using their spatial memory. And what she found was a slight but statistically significant effect. So these dark blue bars, uh, better acquisition in the early parts of um, the task for these retired breeders. We see something very similar with primiparous animals. So this is one, one litter in the uh, radial arm maze where, sorry, radial arm maze, in the Morris water maze, which is a, a reference memory task here, we didn't change the location of the platform, so it stayed in the same place. And we shot, saw again a slide, but a statistically significant effect to improve uh, memory in this task or acquisition in this task for primiparous animals. And uh, Paula's gone on to do some RNA-seq work looking at, this is just RNA-seq in the dorsal uh, hippocampus. And uh, you can see there's a number of genes, gene transcripts that are overlap with, with each other, but there are many that are specific to different Paris groups and particularly with prima parity. And when she did a gene ontogeny analysis, this is not quite ready for prime time, but you can see uh, we saw a lot of different pathways that were um, uh, enriched with, uh, in, with prima parity and aging. Uh, maybe not surprising the dendritic regula regulation given our neurogenesis results. And uh, you know, Sandy might be interested in this vascular pathway, but I want us to draw attention to this response to estradiol pathway. It's a small pathway, but it's one of the ones that was enriched. Um, and I particularly want to pay attention to it because we do find differences in how aging uh, animals respond to estrogens later on in life, depending on parity. So it is really much, pretty much the Cindy Barha show, I should say. Um, so, uh, and she's on the dog market, by the way. Um, so uh, this is in middle age, this is looking at cell proliferation. So the production of those daughter cells, these are nulliparous rats. And you can see with all these different estrogens, it didn't matter which one, nothing happened. Very unlike what happens in a young adult, you see this upregulation in the number of uh, these new cells. But in retired breeders, they act very much like young adults. So they're showing us a sort of more youthful response to these estrogens. Now we've also looked at Premarin, which is a, a much maligned hormone therapy, uh, which I maligned too, I should say. But um, we looked at how it influenced spatial learning. And what we found was that it improved spatial learning in nulliparous animals, but it impaired it in primiparous animals. So we're seeing the exact opposite effects of hormones. And this is long-term. Um, uh, the other one that Cindy did was a, a short-term study, uh, acute exposure to estrogens. And primiparous rats have, uh, as we always show, more new neurons in middle age. Um, but with Premarin, nothing really happened to the number of new neurons in nulliparous animals, but it was decreased in the primiparous animals. 
Now, I did sort of allude to the fact that um, immune function might change, and we are seeing some possible mechanisms, we think some of the possible mechanisms behind some of these long-lasting effects of parity might have to do with immune signaling. So in this particular study, we just looked at circulating levels of um, cytokines and chemokines, uh, but we did see that maybe counterintuitively that Premarin actually increased some of these in the primiparous and the nulliparous animals, but either didn't change them or decreased them in the primiparous animals. Um, and most of these are pro-inflammatory cytokines that we looked at. Uh, uh, Paul has gone on to look at hippocampal neuro, so neuroinflammation again in a variety of chemokines and cytokines and found that you see an upregulation pretty quickly in the uh, early postpartum phase. And again, after they've left the nest, so it's actually quite significantly after they've given birth. Um, uh, and it sometimes depends on parity, sometimes doesn't depend on parity. But the thing that I want you to pay attention to is the age difference. So um, you don't see a big change in these, this neuroinflammation across the Paris groups. It's the nulliparous groups that show this big upregulation with, with aging. So suggesting that parity is altering the trajectory of immune aging in uh, the hippocampus. And that is actually the story that Anne-Marie DeLang and Claudia Barth were sharing in their review article in Finn just recently, suggesting that there might be more pro-inflammatory response in the liparous um, uh, people, but uh, less of an inflammatory response with aging in Paris people. And that's pretty much the same thing we've been showing in our own uh, rodent lit literature as well. Now, I just want to uh, uh, switch gears a tiny bit for the last few minutes to talk about Alzheimer's disease. So uh, there's a triad of non-modifiable viable risk factors of late onset Alzheimer's disease, also obviously advancing age, female sex, you're twice more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease if you're a female compared to a male across your lifespan. And the greatest genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, sporadic Alzheimer's disease is this APOE uh, four allele. So either one or two of these alleles confers a greater risk and particularly in women compared to men. So the data on motherhood's increase, uh, effects to increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease later on in life is a little mixed, uh, but you can see that in some papers, three or more pregnancies was associated with a, a greater percentage of people uh, uh, having Alzheimer's disease. Uh, now, this isn't Alzheimer's disease, this is just a global cognitive, cognitive score, but this particular study found that it was five or more pregnancies as was associated with a reduction in this cognitive score. Again, this is not Alzheimer's disease. This is one of the neuropathologic features of Alzheimer's disease, uh, neuritic plaques. And you can see in blue that males, it doesn't matter how many children they have, there's no change in the number of neuritic plaques in the brain. But in females, once you get two or more, you see this upregulation in these plaques. So how can you sort of reconcile Anne-Marie DeLange's work showing less brain imaging, but then maybe possibly an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease? I think you can reconcile this thinking about the healthy cell bias, thinking about maybe previous parity influences disease risk based on genotype, sort of much like the hormone effects we're finding, maybe genotype might push some of these um, phenotypes further. And Rena Leish has, was the first to show this actually. So this is looking at wild type versus an Alzheimer's mouse model. And these are Paris groups in the black and she so, showed a re reduced latency to reach the goal uh, with parity in the wild type, but actually impaired performance in the Alzheimer's model. So exact opposite effects of parity. And when she looked at those neuroetic plaques in this Alzheimer's model, she saw more with the Paris groups, not in the nulliparous groups, much like um, what was shown in the human data. Now we've been going on and this Bonnie Lee's uh, PhD work, looking at the humanized ApoE4 allele. So that's a, our sort of model of Alzheimer's disease that we've been looking at, sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Uh, recalls a, a greater risk to develop Alzheimer's disease if you have one or two of these alleles. We didn't see a lot of differences in performance on the uh, spatial working memory task. Happy to talk about why that might be. Um, but we did see that these, this genotype did perform more poorly, at least early on in middle age. <laughs> but with Stan Floresco, he suggested we look at the strategies. Are they using an eff efficient strategy or not when they're solving this maze? And in fact, it was only the primiparous uh, APO Alzheimer's model mice that showed this more inefficient strategy to solve the maze. And it actually got worse as time progressed, not better, or it didn't stay the same. 
Bonnie's also looked at neurogenesis, finding the same kinds of things we always find, that primiparous animals have more of these new neurons. And uh, in the APOE4 model, we see a, a main effect of genotype, so they have fewer of these new neurons, but we still see this parity effect. Now, uh, this is preliminary data, but Bonnie's also shown that neural stem cells, so they're the sort of um, the mother of all of these uh, uh, new neurons, uh, that there's a reduction in these primiparous uh, animals, but only in this uh, APOE4 model. Uh, in terms of inflammation, uh, we still don't have all of that data yet, but we did look at one pathway that's stimulated by pro-inflammation, which is the kynarinine tryptophan uh, pathway. And what Bonnie found was that there was higher levels of metabolism in this pa pathway uh, only in the primiparous animals that um, had this, uh, that, that, that is of, of this Alzheimer's disease model, this APOE4 genotype. I have one more uh, study to show you, and that's in humans. And this is the work of Dr. Cindy Barha again and Travis Hodges. And uh, we, even I spent some time in uh, looking at these uh, files in the Alzheimer's clinic uh, at UBC. They were a little dusty, that's why I remember going and looking at the files. Um, and what uh, we've been finding is that it, the story is complicated, but amazing. So if you look at tasks which, which, which recruit more of the medial temporal lobe, and I put the hippocampus there because you know I'm in love with it, you do see that parity is associated with poor performance, but only in the people that had dementia. Uh, and the women that had dementia. You didn't see it in co normal kind of aging or in kind of aging with, without dementia. But that's not the whole story. In other tasks that rely, that are thought to be more uh, involved in, uh, in executive function and, and recruit the prefrontal cortex, we actually saw the opposite effect. So we saw that de dementia, the groups with dementia, high parity was associated with poor performance, or better performance, sorry, not poor performance. So this might be another reason why not just genotype, but brain areas and brain regions are acting differently depending on pr uh, previous parity. So in conclusion, parity alters the aging trajectory of the immune environment and neuroplasticity. It alters the response to estrogens with aging to influence cognition, neuroplasticity, and the immune environment. And just like Santi just said, pregnancy impact, it, pregnancy history can impact disease risk and possibly treatment later on in life. And I really, I completely agree. It really should be something that we consider in terms of precision, precision medicine. And with that, I need to acknowledge all the amazing people in my lab and the funding agencies that have given me uh, uh, money past and present. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Um, any questions from the audience? Anyone want to unmute themselves? Hopefully I wasn't too super, super, super fast. Lots of clapping. I do like the animated claps. Thank you. Sure, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Um, does fetal sex make a difference? Have you been able to look at that at all as far as some of the outcomes? Yes. So, um, yes, it does. I mean, though, I, I, you know, I just didn't have a chance to show everything in 20 minutes and maybe show too much even in 20 minutes. But um, in terms of the Alzheimer's clinic data, it's much easier to look at, as you know, um, and maybe people here don't know, but rats have, a, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20 <laughs> uh, pups. So it's really hard to look at fetal sex, although you can look at fetal sex ratio. So we have all of that information and do go back to look at it. Sometimes we've seen changes with spines, like we've looked at spine uh, density, like um, uh, Emily also uh, looks at as well and seen some differences. In the um, Alzheimer's database, uh, it does, it looks like, I, I've forgotten which way it goes, but it does, uh, it does seem to affect that fetal sex uh, matters. Now, there's another study, that's what I sort of meant in terms of fetal microchimerism. There's another study that's looked at um, those neuritic plaques in the brain and found that if um, uh, you were pregnant with a boy, you had fewer of those neuritic plaques, which is kind of interesting, and maybe follows what Claire Vanson and Neil Watson show, because they found that pregnant with a boy, you're less likely to show some of those cognitive changes. So I think that's really interesting. And I, I think the fetal sex, probably the thing, reason I don't remember it is, A, one, it's hot off the press. 
So this, this literally, we just got this, these data the other day. Cindy's trying to write it out before her due date. <laughs> and um, which, you know, if anybody can do it, she can do it. Um, and I, I think it also depends on the type of task that you're looking at as well, which sort of makes some sense, but it does throw a, a wrench into the works. But it's, it's harder, it's harder. You need big cohorts of uh, animals, I'd say for uh, fetal sex ratio, we always call, so we, um, uh, we always will, will, because they could give birth to so many different animals, we'll always call it down to say an N of 10, five females and five uh, males so that they're all consistent in terms of their maternal care. I'm trying yeah. to remember, did Anne-Marie look at that? In... She did, I think, because at least in one of them, because I asked as a reviewer, <laughs> you know, <laughs> sex play a role. Same with Hoxima, I asked the same question because I was a reviewer for that one too. <laughs> Um, I, and I don't recall that it made a difference. Don't recall. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Um, oh, that sorry. interaction of genotype, genotype and parity, um, is there a difference with an estrogen level or hormonal level or anything like that? Is it goes back to your favorite hormone? Yeah, probably. In fact, we haven't looked at that yet. Um, we will. We do have like estrocycle data and all of that, but I don't know uh, if Bonnie's had a chance to um, analyze all of that yet. But we do have it, and we will look at it. It would be really interesting to see. Do you see regular cycling? Because these are middle aged. Some of them will be could, could actually be cycling even at that uh, time period. So it'd be kind of interesting to see that. And I'm pretty sure, Cindy, we in that paper that paper, that Galia paper. <laughs> Um, with Premarin, I think we did see some differences in terms of irregular cycling by parity. I don't, I think with a chi squared, it didn't quite come out as significant, but there was, there was a hint that there might be some endocrine changes, which um, could absolutely play a role. That's why we'll have to do some of these fancy um, statistics to try and um, uh, take advantage of all of these things. I think Stephanie has her hand up too. We can open it up to everyone too, of course, questions. Yeah. Hi, Lisa. Um, Hi. Um, really cool talk. And Emily and Sandra, too. I really enjoyed everything today. Um, Lisa, I'm wondering if you or others are um, thinking about doing like an immune challenge in association with uh, the APOE genotype and immune interactions, because I think that is a really cool direction. Were you a reviewer on my grant? I was not, but <laughs> I'm glad to hear that you're going that direction because there's some folks at ASU that are doing that in um, in special populations of human models or he, special populations of humans, not models. Uh, um, and I'm really excited to see what happens. In yeah. Yeah. So we just got a grant to look at exactly that to do an immune cool. challenge later on and like and and actually, to be honest, uh, like a metabolic challenge. So. Uh, whether we do high fat or high cholesterol, I don't know, maybe we should do, high, I don't know, I don't know what to do because I don't know anything, I don't, I shouldn't say I don't know anything about metabolism, I know very little about metabolism, um, but we, we, that was the, I think the title of it is, you know, to immune challenges and um, uh, metabolic challenges later on in life. Very yeah, cool. Absolutely. Congrats on the grant and I cannot wait to see what you find. <laughs> now to do the work. I'm going to open up the questions to yeah. all the speakers, but first, before I get in trouble, I need to just make one announcement. So to remind everyone, there is a trainee mentor set session coming up on April 29th uh, with Dr. Marina Ashade that will help trainees learn how to raise their voices and share their ideas with the world. So that's always a good thing. Uh, you can register on the cluster website. And if you are registered for the entire conference, uh, you'll have the session for free. Okay, so now questions for any of the we also, I also badly tweeted out that this is our last symposium. We actually have one more on hot topics and we have like four amazing speakers. So uh, stay tuned for that one. I'll, uh, uh, yeah, I won't say all the names because there's one name I've forgotten, but amazing speakers, take a look on our website. So if you have any questions for any of the speakers, you can raise your hand or unmute yourself and just jump in at this point. We have a, well, it's already 10.30, we have 30 seconds. 
I would just say, and maybe you're going to say this, Cindy, one, one thing that struck me was, because I was trying to pay attention and think about my own talk, but anyway, that, you know, it's a call to arms. I mean, you know, Emily talked about, like, whose body does it serve, right? The, which I love that title of your um, review, uh, Emily, in terms of, you know, what we have all this knowledge, but it's really, really knowledge in one sex. And Sandy mentioned it too, as, as well, in terms of the heart, you know, the heart model. And I do think we need to push our um, healthcare providers to, to tell them about our own pregnancy history because it does matter. And I don't think it matters in relation to men. I, I don't think it always matters in relation to men, right? I mean, especially in human neuroimaging, you know, those of you on Twitter may have been following, it's, it's always this like fraught, are there sex differences in the brain? What does it mean? And there's two very, you know, two different camps. And I, to me, it's sort of not the interesting question. Yeah. Like, I don't exactly. care if they're sex different. Like, women's brains in right. and of themselves experience different things. And how? why are we treating the man as the default, right? Like, we've totally overlooked these critical questions. I mean, again, this, this cluster is sort of the evidence against that of how we are making really cool, doing cool studies to address this. But, like, historically, that has not been the case. Uh -huh. um, no, no, I mean, you're saying, yeah, you're pre like, go... Go, Pre Emily. Preaching to the choir. Yeah. <laughs> preaching to the choir. I, I find it really interesting because people conflate the two. Like, so they'll right. say, oh, women's health, though, that's sex differences. And I'm like, I always, Natalie probably knows because she's probably heard me rant. <laughs> like saying, hey, it's not just about that. Yeah. You know, it's, that, that's a first, I, I now give a talk where I say, look, that's a first step, but it's towards women's health just to say, hey, they're different, but it's not the only thing that matters. Well, I, I have a question if nobody else does, and I do have to run because I have a dissertation, but I, um, I wanted to, Same. oh no. Um, so Sandy, you, you call, and I love this phrase, pregnancy, a physiological tour de force with increased blood volume, you know, one and a half fold, greater cardiac output. Lisa, you mentioned this stat too, 40% increase. What do we know about just that relation in terms of brain, you know, how, how just the purely the cardiac changes might in you know, in fact, blood brain barrier or just blood vasculature system. I'm, I'm totally ignorant on that, but would love to know what we know. I can speak very quickly about the cerebral vascular system, but not mm -hmm. the brain itself. But uh, Marilyn Cipolla at University of Vermont has studied this quite a bit as it relates to pressure changes in the vasculature okay. and how it changes um, that force vasodilation with pressure, um, changes with pregnancy and actually occurs earlier, I, if I have it right. I have, might have copies, but I hope not. But, but that, and that in preeclampsia, um, in our preeclamptic animal models, that changes that set point of when that force phase of dilation occurs. So there's definitely differences in the cerebral vasculature as it relates to pregnancy adaptations that's different in the model system. Okay. But the brain itself, over to you, Lisa. Oh, <laughs> um, well, uh, in fact, that's something we want to do with probably Sandy and another uh, researcher in, uh, named John F. I don't know if you know him, uh, Sandy, but he's been doing some vascular work in the brain. Uh, he's got some really cool imaging effects. So we have a tiny bit of pilot data for a grant, but um, that, so stay tuned. I don't know that anyone's, you know, completely looking at this yet. Um, and we did see some hints in our uh, RNA-seq work too. I've seen a little bit of a hint um, looking at purity history and risk for vascular cognitive impairment. Yeah. Okay. Type of Alzheimer's. So, but okay. I mean, it's just hints. Yeah, it's just I was just looking for my own curiosity because I have a work in the population with UCI. Um, so I think there is something there. Just we haven't looked at it yet. I mean, any like ASL studies looking pre post pregnancy, sort of a hexama type, but using ASL to map cerebrovascular. No, I know uh, what's her name. Uh, Julia Sasher looks at some of that, but not. That's I don't right. think she's okay. done it through it through pregnancy yet. Okay. Add it to the list. <laughs> things the things list. we've got to do. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I think we should. Oh, Alex, did you want to say something before? I had a hopefully kind of quick question, but I know you guys are in a rush. Um, kind of combining Emily's fantastic work. Uh, I imagine that these peaks in estradiol or huge increases in estradiol across pregnancy are leading to 
kind of similar functional reorganization of brain networks. And you guys also see these, this increased working memory postpartum. And just kind of anecdotally, my son's gonna turn one in a couple of weeks. And I've noticed my working memory has not only improved from before to after birth, but in this year, I am able to hold more and more in mind and, and do more things. So I'm, right. I'm curious if you think that maybe some of this functional reorganization with estradiol kind of helps with a training effect postpartum. You've, you're able to improve working memory more as you practice it more in those early days because you've kind of made your functional networks a little bit more um, plastic, we'll say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, Emily, go ahead. Well, I, I think that's an interesting hypothesis and, you know, TBD. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, that's, that's my short answer. I think, you know, we haven't looked at these sorts of, you know, full brain kind of network neuroscience-y um, mm -hmm. changes as it's over um, pregnancy, certainly not in a densely sampled way. And that's, that's one of the things that we're, we're sitting on a mountain of data ready to analyze. So um, maybe you can help us out. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> and I know, I think Alison Fleming has a paper out on prospective memory, because that was always one of those things, you know, like once I became a mom, I was, I was so much better than my husband was at remembering appointments and needing to do this mm -hmm. and that and all that kind of stuff. And, and they do see some, uh, you know, it's not, it's a little bit messy, but they do see some effects depending on maternal age, actually, Sandra. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, anyway, something else to TBD. I like that. <laughs> well, I have to pull out. It was great yeah, to see so everybody. I. Sorry. <laughs> um, still no, care. So Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for all the speakers and everyone that's. Thank uh, you. Enjoy the rest of your Friday. Bye.